Thank you very much. Let's start off with this summary here. Okay, well, well, I keep getting some feedback here. This is why I hesitate when I talk, but maybe if I just talk all the time, it won't matter. Okay. So this, the sort of the summary of the talk is that the shapes or the skewness or asymmetry of marine magnetic anomalies contain important and useful information about paleopoles um, that in our efforts to estimate Pacific plate paleomagnetic poles from these data, we find that the results are robust and that they agree with other reliable kinds of Pacific plate paleomagnetic data, in particular inclination-only data from igneous rocks from ocean drilling. Um, the, the data that we've obtained, as well as other reliable data, indicate to us that the, the that the parent polar wanderer of the Pacific Plate is approximately consistent with fixed hotspots since about 65 million years ago and also uh, since the hotspots have moved relative to the spin axis this probably indicates some true polar wander. So um, also when we use the paleomagnetic data to test the global plate motion circuit, the one that would relate the Atlantic bordering continents to the Pacific Plate, so for example North America to Nubia, to Antarctica, around to the Pacific Plate, we find there must be some kind of a flaw in the circuit that goes through Antarctica, and we think it's most likely due to unmodeled plate motion within Antarctica. Okay, so to get started in talking about um, uh, marine magnetic anomalies and what it is that the skewness or shapes of the anomalies uh, tell us about uh, the magnetization of the seafloor. Um, let's take a look at this little block diagram showing magne magnetization of the seafloor. So if the cursor works here, I'm going to point first to the vector labeled M. And so that's the magnetization uh, within a magnetic prism. And so what we think of this is the uh, this magnetic prism is the chunk of seafloor that's magnetized in a consistent direction uh, during a geomagnetic polarity crime where the field uh, doesn't reverse with within this prism but the but at the edges of the prism here is recorded a reversal and over here is recorded a reversal but in between it's all of the same polarity. So it in the northern hemisphere is going to have a magnetization during normal times it's going to have a, a magnetization that's down and um, we can't get directly at that using skewness data. The thing that we can get at is what is the effective magnetization and that's the projection of this vector onto a vertical plane perpendicular to the magnetic striping. So in this diagram that's the X, XZ plane and so the magnetization we can get at is this M sub E, which is just the projection of M onto that, that plane. So, um, so the, the angle that we can get is called the effective inclination, and it's the angle shown here, E, uh, between uh, ancient magnetic north um, in the horizontal here, down to this vector, M sub E. So it's different from the ordinary paleomagnetic inclination I that we talk about, which is the angle between magnetic north, magnes, ancient magnetic north, and the actual magnetization M over here. So this is I here to over to here. This is E over to here. Um, so our estimate of E, we're going to call e sub, e sub A up here in this equation here, and it's related to something that we estimate from the shape, and that's delta theta, also depends on the um, effective inclination of the present geomagnetic field. But that's something that we know, and also we, uh, 180 degrees comes in there. So since this is just a number, since we know this pretty well, um, if we're able to estimate delta theta, we can get this angle E, or our estimate E. Um, E sub A, which I'm calling apparent effective inclination for reasons that will become apparent later on in the talk. And the apparent is in quotes here as well. 
So without, I'm going to skip over the details of linear filter theory so that we can get to some of the results in this talk. But this slide shows an example of magnetic profiles in the North Pacific on roughly north-south lines that record Pacific Kula uh, spreading. And here they're all projected onto, north, onto the north-south up here on the left-hand side. So these are the observed anomalies and where the pink shading is is anomaly 32 as it's observed. The very bottom most profile is is not an observed profile but a synthetic profile. This is what it should look like if anomaly 32 were created by C4 spreading at the North Pole where the magnetization is vertical and the present magnetic field is also vertical, vertical down in both cases. So you can see that the shape it's all consistently tilting down to the right in the observed ones, but in the synthetic one, top of anomaly 32 is pretty flat. So if we apply a phase shift to this, and we try different values until we find the one that works best, we can get this anomaly using just simple linear filter, uh, basic linear filter theory, to look like these, which much more closely resemble the synthetic anomaly 32 down here. So you can see here the top of anomaly 30, 32 is flat, or roughly flat in every case. And, and these here are the values that it took. I can't read them on my screen, but they're all roughly 90 degrees uh, in terms of what the phase content is of these anomalies right here. Okay, so this next slide is an example of results from skewness. So the, once we've estimated delta theta, the phase shift in all of these anomalies, in this case from all over the Pacific plate, everywhere we could find crossings of anomaly 32, then we can do a simple reduction, get the apparent effective inclination. And on this plot, the magnitude of the apparent effective inclination is shown by the height of the little rectangular prisms. So where they're white, those are positive inclinations or positive effective inclinations, as one would expect for normal, normally magnetized seafloor in the northern hemisphere. Then farther south, we see ones that are shaded, and these are negative values. Whoops, didn't want to switch yet. Um, as expected during the normal polarity time in the southern hemisphere. And so where we go from gray to white must be the ancient uh, paleo equator in this case. So another way to plot up the data is shown on the right hand side of this figure. All the open circles or squares are the observed effective inclinations and they're plotted up against the um, paleo latitude. Um, and then the black circles are, are squares are what's calculated from the, the best fitting pole assuming uh, a dipole magnetic field. Um, excuse me a minute, I'm actually bringing up a, a copy of this slide that's a little bigger on my own screen right here so that I can uh, tell you better what's in it. Okay, so but anyway, you can see there's, there's a, a big variation in effective inclination as we go from north to south with values that are up around plus 60 in the northern hemisphere and then we get all the way to about minus 120 in the, in the southern hemisphere. And be, because these are with respect to the direction in which the seafloor gets younger, we don't cut them off just at 90, they keep on going and in fact can spin all the way around to um, all, all directions on the compass. So it's possible to have values anywhere in between 0 and 360 degrees for, for these effective inclinations. Um, also note that where it varies most rapidly is right here. This is the paleo equator uh, or the, 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 the low latitudes. So from this diagram we can see we get some hint that most of the information about where the paleomagnetic pole is is in these low paleo latitudes because small changes in latitude along here lead to large changes in the values of the effective inclinations. Okay, so we'll go to this next slide 
And this is just a simple cartoon to illustrate a complication that we uh, have, have to deal with, which is called a, anomalous skewness. So the upper is just, these are both synthetic profiles. The top one is just a synthetic profile uh, assuming vertical boundaries uh, between reversals over a standard block model. This would be the axis of the mid-ocean ridge with seafloor formed during the last 780,000 years here and then things get older away from the axis in both both cases. So this is uh, the central anomaly. Uh, we get over to a, a anomaly two over here and, and so on. So we've we've put on little lines to show you how the tops of each of these anomalies tilts. And this is what we'd expect for this simple magnetization model shown down here in the bottom. But what's often observed is that um, we get uh, steeper dips to, to the bottoms here and to the tops and equally so over on on this side, which isn't predicted by this model. And this difference between observed and what's predicted for the simple model is known as an anomalous skewness. So the next slide illustrates a little bit more about anomalous skewness. Um, over here in the left panel, um, in both cases, the seafloor gets younger to the right. On the left panels, we'll, we're talking about times of normal polarity like today, so let's only just talk about that. So in the northern hemisphere, the, the, the seafloor or the effective magnetization of the seafloor might be in a direction like this, E sub R. Because of anomalous skewness, it will appear to be shallower in the northern hemisphere and in, in this direction, E sub A. But if we go to the southern hemisphere, say we have this direction, E sub R here, Anomalous skew skewness rotates it in a consistent way, which causes it to be not shallower, but, but steeper in the southern hemisphere. So that is the um, a sy a systematic effect that um, we need to be able to treat if we want to get reliable paleomagnetic poles. So I'm going to show you the first of several approaches we've taken in the, the, the next slide. In this slide, on the left, each of these curves is a great semicircle corresponding to um, a group of data for which we have phase shifts estimated um, and for which we have um, um, and, and for any one of these, for example, let's just pick one out of here. Let's take um, CF1, this one right here. So this is half of a great circle. A paleomagnetic pole anywhere along this half of this great circle is going to be consistent with the phase shifts we observe in ancient um, Pacific Farallon uh, anomalies. <laughs> the CF is for central Farallon. Um, and then similarly, CF2, any pole along this half of a great circle, which ex extends beyond this diagram, is consistent with the phase shifts observed along this, this group, group of profiles. So in the absence of any systematic errors and in the absence of noise, all of these would intersect at a single point. But obviously they don't. But when we fit them by least squares, we find a least squares best fit um, right here. Well, we have a hundred data or so and we have only two adjustable parameters, the latitude and longitude of the pole. So one of the approaches we took was said, let's just assume anomalous skewness has the same value everywhere and we'll just treat it as a third adjustable parameter with our hundred observations or so. And so we do this over on the right and we get a much better fit. You can see that, that we get a much better, do a much better job of all the great semicircles intersecting except for this one outlier right here. When we do that, um, we find that our estimate of anomalous skewness is plus or minus uh, four, four degrees. Um, one thing that, that you might notice here is that while a lot of the great, great semicircles seem to have moved a lot between the diagram on the left and the diagram on a lot, 
this group right here, cent Central Farallon 2, Central Farallon 1, North Farallon 3, North Farallon 2, and North Farallon 1, don't move very much in between the two diagrams. And there's a geometrical reason for this. It's because they're near the tips of these great circles, and the tips of the great circles uh, don't move at all if you know the strikes of the anomalies perfectly well. So the next slide is, 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 is tries to illustrate what this is all, all about. But what we can, what you might think from just looking at this slide is that this group of data gives us a much stronger constraint on where the pole is than say these data way out here. Okay. So what this diagram shows is um, if if we look not just at merely at the great semicircle, but the uncertainties in the great semicircle, then we get a loon-shaped region, best seen right, right here, um, um, in which within uncertainties the paleomagnetic pole must lie to, be, to agree with the uncertainty from an individual profile or a group of profiles that are located, an average from a group of profiles that are located near one, one another. And so there's some obvious observations you can make. In the middle of this loon-shaped region, the un it's the fattest and most uncertain in pole position in, in this direction relative to the ends, where if in fact the pole was near here, it would give us a very strong constraint on the pole. The other thing that you can observe is that along the long axis of the loon, there's no constraint at all. Um, so really, we're just constraining one degree of freedom with, this, with an individual skewness observation or, or a group of skewness observations that are located where the magnetic profiles are near one another. So we get a constraint here. So no constraint this direction. Weak constraint here, but a very strong constraint if the pole is near the tip, which is what we see in the case of, uh, once again, Central Farallon 2, Central Farallon 1, North Farallon 3, North Farallon 2, North Farallon 1. So these, which happen to all be in low paleo latitudes, are what are giving us the strongest constraints. Okay, so what about this assumption that we made um, that, um, that anomalous skewness has the same value at all the, the, the different sites. Well, it turns out that this may not be a, a perfect assumption, but in a lot of situations, it's, it's, it's a good assumption. Here I'm showing results from a study by um, um, uh, Dimo and Arkani Hamad, uh, based on the work of Dimo and his, and his colleagues in the Indian Ocean, in which they estimate anomalous skewness for various, uh, for various spreading rates. And they looked at two different anomalies. So first of all, anomalous skewness is on this vertical axis and uh, spreading rate, or really half spreading rate, in kilometers per million years or millimeters per year, it's the same thing, um, are shown right here. These are the results for anomaly 33R, about uh, 75 to 80 million years ago. Uh, along here. So we get high values up above 40, but they decrease with increasing spreading rate. And once you get above 50 millimeters a year or 50 kilometers a, uh, per million years, there's uh, no significant anomalous skewness. Then here's the results for anomaly 25R, which is actually the same as we did in our Pacific study. And here, once again, it's gets peak values up around 30 degrees of anomalous skewness, then decreasing with uh, increasing spreading rate, uh, and then becoming insignificant for faster than half rates of 50 millimeters a year. Um, they have developed a model of the magnetization of seafloor, which is consistent with these observations. So um, in their model, at very fast spreading rates, the only part of the seafloor that gets uh, <clears throat> magnetized is the upper crust, layer 2A. And to a good approximation, 
although it is only approximate, you have vertical reversal boundaries. So this is just like the simple model that we've been using since um, the early 1970s. However, as the rate of seafloor spreading decreases, the magnetization in 2A becomes weaker and, and lower layers in the lower most crust and the uppermost mantle, here you can see magnetization shown down to depths of 20 kilometers or more, uh, develop and the, the boundaries between normal and reverse portions are, decla are um, obtained over a, a longer amount of time and depend on uh, when things cool past the blocking temperatures and their curve. And so that's a big difference from the simple model that we used from the beginning. And then the effect is most pronounced at really slow spreading rates. Here's one at 10 millimeters a year at, at the bottom. So uh, their model, um, their results indicate there's a spreading rate dependence. So how does that stack up with what we got when we assumed uh, no dependence on spreading rate? So uh, here I kind of combined the, the two figures. Um, this part of the diagram shows Pacific Farallon um, spreading rates. And you can see that most of them are between 35 and 45 to 50 millimeters a year, with just a few slower ones when we get very far south on the Pacific Farallon uh, boundary. From these data, we estimated that anomalous skewness was 14 plus or minus 4, so 10 to 18 um, degrees. Now here's that same diagram I showed you before from um, uh, Dimo and Arkani Hamid. Um, so we can zero in on that same range of spreading rates. So between about, um, what do we got here, 35 to 50 millimeters a year going this way. And where it overlapped the curve for 25R is in this region, and that comes out over on this axis to um, it's centered on about 10 to 20 um, uh, degrees of anomalous skewness, which is very close to the 14 plus or minus 4 um, uh, that, that we obtained. Okay. Well, how would our results be affected if instead of um, assuming uniform anomalous skewness at all sites, we use their model to predict uh, what anomalous skewness is as a function of spreading rate and applied it as a correction to our data. We recently did this uh, in a study with uh, Amelia Covista as the, um, the, 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 the lead author. So this, this poll here, which is the red, which is covered up, you can barely see it peeking through here with a dark blue uncertainty, was the Pacific Plate Paleomagnetic Pole for Anomaly 32 about 70 million years ago that we obtained in the original study where we assumed a, um, a, a uniform correction for anomalous skewness at all sites. This, this uh, purple pole with a lighter blue confidence limits is what we get obtained if we first apply the correction of Dimo and Okarni Hamed to our data and then invert them. When we do this, we can also uh, solve for anomalous skewness to see whether or not their correction has captured all the anomalous skewness. When we do that, we find that we get anomalous skewness, residual anomalous skewness, since we've already subtracted their model, of three plus or minus four degrees. And in other words, it's an insignificant amount of a uh, anomalous skewness, and thus the model of Dimon and Arkani Hamid successfully explained the anomalous skewness in the data, and the difference between the paleomagnetic poles, whether we use the uniform anomalous skewness correction or if we use the spreading rate dependent uh, anomalous skewness correction, the pole changes very, very little, obviously insignificantly since the poles lie within the uncertain confidence limits of each other. Okay, so that brings you up to date in our studies of the poll for Quran 32 about 72 million years ago. And just, I'm only going to take one slide to show us you our results um, for anomaly 25R, 57 million years old, 
from skewness data. So once again, like in the other diagram that I showed you, the open circles are the observations uh, on this left panel, and then the solid circuit circles are the um, the ones calculated from the best fitting pole. Once again, in this study, we had three adjustable parameters, the pole latitude, the pole longitude, and anomalous skewness is assumed to be independent of, of, of spreading rate. We still haven't done the spreading rate dependent correction on this, on this data set. Um, once again, we get a span in, in um, effective inclinations from about minus 120 in the southern hemisphere up to plus 50 or higher in the northern hemisphere. This shows the best fitting pole, uh, a standard error, 95% confidence limits, and even a 99% confidence limit. Um, it, so so it's, it's reasonably compact uncertainty, not as small as we get for Anomaly 32. All right. In the next slide, you're going to just take a look at uh, um, a plot that of Pacific northward motion. So really we should be looking at, you know, uh, not only northward motion, but also rotations, changes in declination, but it's easier to make a plot in just one dimension for this. And what all of these filled circles are, are dated volcanic edifices along the Hawaiian emperor chain. So all the northward motion is, is the present latitude of that dated edifice minus the present latitude of um, Kilauea. Um, also shown are paleo latitude indicators, and I want to focus on the time interval older than 40 million years, but younger than 90 million years. Um, so I just showed you the poll result for anomaly 25R 57 million years ago. That's shown right here. I also showed you the one for 32, Anomaly 32, about 72 million years right here. Uh, we published, but only in abstract form, results for 33N and 33R, so 75 to 80, 80 to 85 million years ago. But the point is with these and also the other data that we've plotted up on this, many of which are equatorial sediment facies, is that these are showing less northward motion than you get by just looking at the dated volcanic edifices. So what this tells you is that um, relative to the spin axis that the Hawaiian hotspot has moved southward in time. And this has been established since uh, 1980. Um, um, but, 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 but it also shows you that it looks like it increases in time and it may be that um, it changed between 80 and 90, but that's a subject for a different talk. So there's been some more recent well, not so recent now, but a uh, dozen years ago, new, new results from, um, or 10 years ago, new results from deep sea drilling that also indicated um, southward motion of the Hawaiian hotspot that can be used to check on the validity of the results that we're getting from skewness data. And on the next slide, I just simply lay them over this slide. So these are the results from uh, Leg 197, uh, Tarduno et al., 2003. So here, here and here, and you can see that they're in very good agreement with our 25R, our 32, and also our 33N and 33R R results. So this, along with uh, the deep sea drilling results on, on Suico, are all consistent with the results we're getting from skewness. It's just that we can look at a lot more ages and get more compact confidence limits with the skewness data for a lot less money than is possible with uh, deep sea drilling. Okay, returning back to, to skewness, several times I've mentioned that um, that we see rapid variations in the effective inclinations near the uh, paleo equator, uh, and, and and this is. Um, illustrated in this diagram right here. So along this axis, we have paleo latitude from uh, plus 90 at the back to minus 90 um, in, in the front. And then these are the paleo strike of your uh, magnetic 
lineations. So no matter what the strike, the most rapid variation in affective inclination, uh, as is also true for just simply inclination, a magnetic inclination is near the paleo equator, as shown here off at this edge, or shown here off at uh, off at off at this edge. Um, with, with with the mildest change right here, and this would be for east-west striking anomalies, and this would just be the dipole formula right here. But when we have uh, magnetic striping that's nearly north north south, as we get off on the edge here. It's much more steeper and, and hence much more sensitive to the pole position. So it's a natural way in which um, the, the data form near the paleo equator, such as by Pacific Farallon spreading, with nearly north-south striking stripes, it gives us a very powerful constraint on where the, the pole position is. And so on our more recent work, we have focused not on obtaining skewness estimates from all over the Pacific plate, but in fact, Working for ones in low paleo latitudes straddling the paleo equator. So I want to talk to you next about a more recent result where we obtained a poll for anomaly 12 R about 32 million years ago. So this is the location map for the, the data. Here's a little inset map so you can see we're in the equatorial Pacific in this little box right here. Okay, this is anomaly 12, anomaly 13. It's offset um, at the Clipperton infractor zone, anomaly 12, anomaly 13. And these are all the data available to us, both shipboard data and also um, aeromagnetic data. Um, so they, they provide very strong constraints on where the paleo equator is, and it looks like, in fact, as we'll see from the later slides, the paleo equator is roughly here near the uh, Clipperton infractor zone. I can't remember if it's north or south of it, but it will be apparent in, the, in a couple slides down the road. Okay, so these are all the individual profiles when we project them perpendicular to, to striping. Okay, so, and we've also reduced them to our best fitting magnetic pole. So you're not seeing the wild variations in phase shift that are evident in the, in, in the, in the uh, observed data. We just see the order that's brought about by reducing them um, to, to the pole. So the black colored profiles are ones that we actually used in the inversion. The uh, gray colored profiles uh, weren't used in the inversion and are just used to uh, further illustrate the value of reducing these all to, to the pole. So the ones here are between the Galapagos and the, 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 the Clipperton. So we start near the present equator and go uh, north. And this group here is between the, the Clipperton and the, 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 the Clarion. So um, once again, here's this is a synthetic magnetic anomaly. Um, this one is appropriate for shipboard data. Here's another synthetic at the bottom. This one's appropriate for aeromagnetic data. We can follow anomaly 12 up. It's shaded in right here. We can follow anomaly 13 up over on this side. And then the interval in between is 12R. And when we uh, estimate phase shifts for these data, we try to flatten the bottom of 12 bars. So you can see some variations, but on average, the, uh, um, the dip uh, on this feature is, is zero. And here, the same is true here. Here we see some very low amplitude anomalies, but 12 R, 12 is clear, and over here 13 is, is clear. Okay, we can take a look at the effective um, inclinations that we get from these data. So on the horizontal axis, we see um, the effective ruminant in inclination. Here we, since we do, aren't doing the whole Pacific plate, the range of effective inclinations isn't as big as we saw before, but it's still quite large. 
we get down almost to minus 50 over here, and then we get up to plus 80. So even though we're only looking at 17 degrees of uh, latitude here, we are in fact um, getting variations of about 130 degrees in the remnant affected uh, inclination. Here's the Clifford and Fracker zone, and the Paleo Equator is where the inclination is zero, and you can see that the uh, Paleo Equator is very near the Clifford and Fracker zone um, in, in these data. So um, I haven't mentioned anything about anomalous skewness with these data, and in fact, that's one of the, the beauty of this particular data set. The slowest half spreading rate here is probably about 70 millimeters a year, so they're all faster than the threshold above which there is no significant anomalous skewness. So we haven't had to do anything about anomalous skewness. We can neglect it com completely in this uh, analysis and still get a poll with compact confidence levels. Okay, so the next slide, I'm going to show you the suite of um, great semicircles where I show a great semicircle for every one of our crossings. And in fact, I show the, with the vector magnetic data from the airplanes, the, um, I, I show both the vertical and the horizontal components and we analyze them then separately. So, um, if the curves are solid on this diagram, if, for example, these three here, they are aeromagnetic data, if they're dashed, then they're from shipboard data. We get a very good intersection of all the data here with this blue uncertainty. And if we use only the aeromagnetic data, then we get this uh, pole right here with this orange uncertainty. So um, even though we're only looking at data over 17 degrees of latitude, we get very compact confidence limits, uh, a very well-determined pole for 32 million years ago for the Pacific Plate. So on the next slide, I compare that pole to some other relevant paleomagnetic poles of roughly the same age. So the blue shaded one, again, is the one that we get from skewness data. So here we're looking north pole projection. Here's 180 east over here. The Greenwich is down here. Here is the 32 million year old pole for the Pacific Plate from the skewness data. This pink one right here is a pole that we determine from equatorial sediment facies uh, using the data of uh, Paris and, and, and more. And then, um, it, and, and the 95% uh, confidence limits of each of two include each other. They're consistent with one another. So slightly different, but significantly statistically significantly different is this pole that I've shaded in in green. And it's mainly coming from uh, sediment results from piston pores. And it's very well known that there's a tendency for sedimentary results uh, to be shallowly biased. And in fact, the difference between our skewness pole and this sediment paleomagnetic pole is entirely consistent with um, inclination shallowing of about six degrees in, in these sediments. And we think that that's what causes the difference, is that the, the biased inclinations in the, the sediments. So it's encouraging to see that they're so close, but the difference also seems to be about right, given what we know about inclination error in sediments. So also shown here is the um, where the paleomagnetic pole is predicted to be if the spin axis has been fixed with respect to the hot spots for the last 32 million years. And so that's this yellow pole um, labeled HS. And even though the blue and the yellow touch, they differ statistically significantly. So this indicates that even in the last 32 million, past 32 million years, there's been significant motion of Pacific hotspots uh, with respect uh, to the spin axis. So naturally, one would like to know, well, is this because just the hot spots are moving all relative to each other, and therefore uh, it's not surprising that they're moving relative to the spin axis? Or is it because the whole Earth has moved relative to the spin axis in what is known as true polar wander? 
And the way to test this is to look at similarly determined paleomagnetic poles um, for paleomagnetic data that has been related to the hotspots in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And that result is shown on the next slide. So the two orange poles, one for 30 million years, one for 40 million years, is from the work of Bess and Cordio, and it shows where the spin axis was in a reference frame tied to the hotspots in the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans uh, in the hotspot reference frame. So this pole has been rotated with the Pacific plate from the last slide into the fixed hotspot reference frame, and you can see the fact that it agrees with the Indo-Atlantic pole shown in orange shows that these results are consistent with the hot spots in the Pacific Basin being approximately fixed with respect to those in the um, Atlantic Basin and, and Indian Ocean Basin. We also rotated that orange yellow pole from the last one which showed the, the hot spots and the pole predicted assuming that the spin axis and the hot spots are fixed. So at the center of this is, since this is the hotspot reference frame, the center of this has to lie right on top of the spin axis. But now what it's giving us is an uncertainty in the hotspot reference frame. So um, once again, even though the blue and the yellow touch, they're significantly different. And this indicates that we have significant motion of the um, Pacific hotspots with respect to the the spin axis, but we also see significant motion of the Atlantic Ocean hotspots with respect to the spin axis. But the two hotspots don't have significant mo groups of hotspots don't move significantly relative to one another. So that's the result since 32 million years ago. Um, next slide. I just want to review some other results. This is from the classic paper by Jason Morgan in 1981, where he was looking at. A similar sort of thing for 60 million years ago. Once again, we're in a fixed hotspot reference frame. All the um, continents have been moved relative to the hotspots in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, and so have their paleomagnetic poles. And the grand average paleomagnetic poles for Indo-Atlantic at 60 million years ago is this orange circle right here. Um, Morgan used only the results from deep sea drilling on Suico Seamount to determine a paleo latitude, which just gives them a small circle instead of a unique pole. That arc is shown here. It agrees with this. Uh, since this work now 30 years ago, um, nothing has happened in the data set to cause us to any of this to change. This result is still um, correct. And we can also look at uh, a result that builds on this, once again, from my work with Cheryl Cape 30 years ago. Here's that same orange pole for the Indo-Atlantic hotspots. Here's that same small circle for Suico right here. But here are results from equatorial sediment facies, um, which give us great circles rotated in the Pacific hotspot frame here for 70 million years, here for 60 million years. We can combine them all together to get a unique pole position shown by this star. And this uncertainty, and once again, this uncertainty, this is, does not dig differ significantly with this, consistent with the hotspots being fixed for the last, um, approximately fixed for the past 60 million years. So I keep saying approximately fixed. You know, the hotspots, nobody believes the hotspots are perfectly fixed. It's a matter of how fast they move. So in this case, approximately fixed, maybe five millimeters a year. From other work that I've done, I can't rule out motion as fast as 10 or 12 millimeters a year, but I think faster than that we can exclude. Okay, I can see I've already used up 45 minutes, um, so I'm going to just skip over this slide quickly, showing uh, how good the agreement is between skewness-only data and non-skewness data when we calculate a paleomagnetic pole for the Pacific Plate for 65 million years ago. The next slide is a schematic of the global plate motion circuit that we use um, to test um, uh, hotspot circuits and also paleomagnetic uh, data could be rotated in from any of these continents into the Pacific plane frame through this circuit. For example, Eurasia to North America to Nubia 
to Antarctica, uh, assume little or no motion between East and West Antarctica, and then we can go to the uh, Pacific Plate. Okay, again, because time is running short, I'm going to skip over all the details in this slide and go to kind of a summary results slide. When we rotate the paleomagnetic poles from the continents into the Pacific plate reference frame through that global plate motion circuit that I just showed you through Antarctica, there are two key results I want to res emphasize. The first is shown on the left. Here we're showing this in a fixed Pacific uh, reference frame. This is where the poles from the rest of the globe for 57 million years uh, wind up. This is the pole that we find for 57 million years from direct Pacific Plate data. They do not overlap. They look like they're significantly different. This implies there's a, a break in the circuit, probably unmodeled motion between East and West Antarctica. We can do the same test at about 65 million years ago. Here is a pole for 66 million years ago for paleomagnetic poles from the continents rotated into the Pacific Plate through the global plate motion circuit through Antarctica, this is where they wind up. But this is the directly observed pole for 65 million years. So once again, there's a gap here in between them. Uh, once again, suggesting a break in the circuit. Okay. Another way to look at it is shown in this slide here. We can predict, um, well, let's see, can't read that. We can predict uh, the northward motion of the, we, we can observe the northward motion of the Pacific Plate from hotspot tracks, such as the Hawaiian Emperor Chain. This solid curve right here shows that observed northward motion at a reference point um, so, so, somewhere along the Emperor Chain, I believe. Okay, but we can use the hotspot tracks in the other ocean basins to predict the motion um, of the Hawaiian hotspot, and it gives us a predicted track that indicates less northward motion. These are two alternative sets of reconstructions in the Atlantic. So there's a gap that some people have used to infer motion between the Pacific hotspots and the Indo Atlantic hotspots. We can perform the same test, though, through the same circuits using paleomagnetic data, um, which um, if, in fact, this inference is correct, then the paleomagnetic data ought to agree between directly observed Pacific Plate data and um, the data rotated in from um, paleomagnetic poles from all the continents into the Pacific Plate reference frame. Well, we just showed you, I just showed you a summary slide that shows that they disagree. And this is just another way of looking at it, looking at it only in terms of northward uh, motion. Um, so here's our new 32 million year pole connected up to our 57 million year old pole and then there's our 65 million year old pole. So here is the directly observed in the Pacific plate. Um, here are the ones that we rotated in from the other continents and they all systematically lie below this curve when we get out to ages greater than 50 million years. So if we, you know, out here they seem to be plausibly in agreement over here, though, the directly observed northward motion is greatly greater than that predicted through the, the circuit. Okay, so the observed minus predicted northward motion from hotspot tracks on the one hand and paleomagnetic data on the other um, are in good agreement. And this implies that the hotspots are approximately fixed, that is, the ones in the Pacific relative to the Indo-Atlantic, uh, and that the global plate motion circuit through Antarctica fails in the early tertiary and latest um, Cretaceous. Okay, so I tried to cover a lot of ground in, in this talk, and I'm sorry if I jumped a lot from topic uh, to topic. Um, here's a summary of some of the things we've learned over the last 30 years about estimating paleomagnetic poles from skewness data. What, first of all, most of the information on the pole location is in the nearly north-south striking striping in low paleo latitudes. 
Uh, most of the information on anomalous skewness, on the other hand, is in the more east-west striking, striking lineations that are in high paleo latitudes. Something that I didn't really dis discuss, but is um, a part of our current strategy for improving the apparent polar wonder path is, of the Pacific Plate is that it's a lot easier to analyze long crons than short, short crons. I think that long crons like 12R that I showed you some examples there, it's much easier to objectively estimate um, the phase shift of these than it is for the narrow ones that produce more spiky anomalies instead of long flat anomalies. Um, the results from skewness are very consistent with independent reliable paleomagnetic data. In particular, they're consistent with the results we get from that have been obtained from inclination only data from deep sea drilling and igneous rocks on the Pacific. I did not develop this very much, but vector error magnetic profiles in low paleo latitudes are information rich. I mean, simply for a lack of time, I wasn't able to show the way in which the uh, vector data from the airplanes really eliminates major sources of noise that come in from diurnal variation and from the electrojet. Okay, and also I've mentioned um, in the course of this work three ways to overcome challenges of anomalous skewness. One is to solve it, solve for it, treat it as an adjustable parameter. This seems to work pretty robustly. Uh, another is to, to model it using a model like that of Dimon and Arkani Hamid so that if we know what the spreading rates are, we can make a correction for it and then um, just simply invert for the pole parameters and not for anomalous skewness. Or, as in the case for the anomaly 12R example I showed you, use profiles um, where the spreading rate half rates are greater than 50 kilometers per million year because then there is no anomalous skewness is negligible and we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so in summary, just as in the beginning of the talk, the shapes, skewness, and marine magnetic anomalies contain important and useful information about paleomagnetic poles for the Pacific Plate. The poles that we estimate for the Pacific Plate from skewness appear to be robust. Inclination-only data from igneous rocks motion drilling are in good agreement with what we find from skewness and help validate those skewness results. The skewness data are consistent with the fixed hotspot approximation, with the caveat that it is approximation, since about 65 million years ago and indicate true polar wander, the motion of the entire solid Earth, including the hot spots relative to the spin axis, in amounts of, you know, 5 to 10 degrees, not huge amounts. And then finally, skewness and other reliable Pacific Plate paleomagnetic data indicate a flaw in the global plate motion circuit through Antarctica. Thank you very much.